Welcome everybody that's live. This is TFC podcast number 16 with the uh, international man of mystery. We need to ask Dan about this, but Dan Fichter. Uh, we're going to talk about neurology and implementation of that neurology today. Dan, tell everybody something about you. Um, I, JL gave me that nickname. I have no idea why. Um, but uh, I'm just a high school football coach, high school track coach. Um, it's trying to get better. It's trying to get better. And stumbling on the TFC stuff for the last few years has been absolutely awesome to learn. Um, and just to see people with like-minded getting together and, and sharing some information. Now, tell me again about your athletic career. The mm. Hall of Famer, HOF, baby. That's what I thought. <laughs> Look at the picture in the background. It's on the back shelf. Is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. I know it's there. Um, played a little football in high school. Had a uh, pretty successful high school football team. Played with uh, um, the Detroit Lions old running backs coach in Syracuse University. He's like six all-time leading rusher. He was our tailback. So we had a pretty good high school football team. Played in college, uh, Division three. Um, played a little bit for the Toronto Argonauts and I played, uh, two seasons in the arena football league. Um, then that kind of beat me up a little bit, kind of when Kurt Warner was playing for the Iowa barnstormers. And, uh, that's kind of where the whole speed thing started and, uh, chasing, chasing stuff. Um, trying to make myself run as fast as 40 as I can. And, uh, I was able to clock a pretty, pretty quick time. So, uh, you know, it was interesting last night, Dan, Blue Shexnader said that in his opinion, 75% of all NCAA football players fail to reach their genetic ceiling and speed. Hmm. 75%. And you would think with speed being the central part of today's game, that speed would be maybe the priority. And yeah, I don't think it is. Yeah. Um, I also think there's a bit of maturity that happens there too. Um, I think I got faster when I got out of college. I mean, just because of the, the training, I was able to, you know, you, you get out of the strength game and you start running. So you can take that strength now that you've built for so many years and you actually transfer it by sprinting. <laughs> it's funny how that works. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm we're having a family crisis. Someone had COVID and went to my mom's house and. Well, I'll, I'll start off the questions. All right, the, I got uh, a bunch. I, I actually, I'll start, I got one. Totally okay, good. go ahead. So Dan, how did you get to this point with neurology? What was, what's been your journey to get to this point? Well, the journey in, includes you. So if, you, if you guys are into starts, it's pretty neat. Um, it started with training myself. Right. So I used to get together with a guy and in, in people in the track and field community might know this name. So my um, one of the guys I played college football with was a guy who never played college football or never played football before growing up. He was a wrestler and he was a pole vaulter. So he came to the same college I did. And I was like, man, this guy's fast. And we started we bonded, we started training together. And then after college, when I went on to play, he was kind of like my coach, but same age and everything, but we kind of did all the crazy stuff, over speed stuff with the bungees and all that kind of stuff. It's his name is Rick Schur, right? So Rick Schur is the coach of um, the best pole vaulter in the, the United States has ever seen. So it's, it's funny when I see him training, I remember training with him years ago. So then it went into the geez, speed dynamics, Olympic lifts, Mel Sif, the, that whole board where we met Cal and, and then Ken J from Lyle, Illinois, um, introducing me to Peter way in and then comes along Chris where we start talking and West side barbell, Jay Schroeder. But what's crazy is I look back now is neurology helps me connect to dots to all these different training philosophies and there becomes these overarching things that that neurology really controls a lot of what we do and the results that we get. Um, you know, it went from DB Hammer into Douglas Heel. That was probably the aha moment when I when I went over to London to hear Douglas speak, and <clears throat> I was blown away. First person I called was Chris, and I said, "It's one of those things where it makes you go, oh boy, 
there's a hell of a lot more that's out there than I, th- man, I thought I knew something and now I don't know anything. So it's like back to the drawing board. And then, you know, with Professor Carrick and, and his clinical neurology stuff, and there's just been so many paths that I've gone down that have led me to where I am now, which is trying to take this neurology and make it, um, make it come to life in a training session. And so with that in mind, how did you bring that into your team? And how do you sell something like this to your team or, or your clients? Because I think I th- one of the questions we're going to get to, and maybe we should do this now and then we can go to this next, is you kind of have, like I do, kind of a dichotomy where you're a coach and you have your team and then you have a gym and you have athletes that don't play for you in fact, some, most of the time they play against you and they show up at your gym and you train them. I mean, you write programs, you have a much larger facility than I have. And I have a basement, although you did start in your garage too. And then you have a, a good size facility. And I think it's interesting to ask, how do you train your athletes, the Arondacoy, what are you guys now? You're not. The We're the Warriors. Eagles. The Eagles. No, we're not a war eagles. eagles. Come That's, on, they're war eagles. They're not war eagles. They're they're like Bayhawks. <laughs> How do you train the war eagles differently than the people from Athens and all the other dastardly teams in the Rochester area that I hate so much? <laughs> well, I tell you, at, at my gym, you'll see a lot of the the. Um, the roots of, of where I grew up learning training, which would be DB Hammer, Jay Schroeder, all those things can be implemented based off of individual programs where I'll evaluate kids on their movement profile, how they produce force, how they jump, how they launch themselves in the air, whatever it is, we're looking at that. And then we're devising programs that kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, when it comes to my high school team, I'm a little bit more, I put the neurology into our warm-up. Um, we're hardly ever in the weight room. We're always outside training after football practice. And that's the best part about being a football coach is I'm the strength coach too. So I can fire myself, hire myself. If I don't believe the philosophy, then I can get rid of the person. And that's me. Um, so we, we tend to do a lot of isometrics um, and water bag stuff and a lot of movement stuff um, for our training at the high school. Um, and, and Chris, and I know you've gone through this. I probably get more, um, inquiries about training from people out of state or out of our area than I do in area. Cause I think people are, are very, um, I don't know. You never be famous at home. Yeah. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. I don't know about famous, but maybe it's very competitive at home. So people don't want to really say, Hey, I want to go see this guy. Right. But so it's a little bit different, but everything is, is basically the same in terms of teaching position. Um, we're always sprinting. Um, there, there's been a stretch of time here for, for the last three months where we haven't touched a weight. We're just sprinting and I love it. And how, how does the buy-in go? What's the sales job or the, the pitch to get athletes, I mean, it's one thing at a school where you're the head coach and this is what we do. And if you don't like it, you know, go play volleyball or someone's paying you money and you've got to explain to a parent who's paying you X amount of dollars per session or whatever package you have. Why are we doing this? Right. Well, shouldn't we be squatting for the, for the, for the kids, it's easy. You, you can produce strength. You can produce these results in, in, you know, in, I've done a couple of talks where I call them neural hacks, right? So you're going to implement some type of, of a neural hack and boom, all of a sudden somebody's stronger or they jump higher or they run faster and the kids are wowed by it, right? That gets their buy-in. For the parents, I spend a lot of time telling them what they want to hear and then we just do what we do. Um, 
And then again, someone will say to me, wow, you worked on his high knees while he was running. No, that's not what we did, but okay. And oh yeah, you're right. We did a ton of form drills. That's what we were doing. So I, I tend to, to deal with the parents one way and I just, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh yeah, that's, we're definitely doing that. And then the results speak for themselves. So that's the way I get away with it. If that's what you call it. So what kind of results, what kind of data can you put on this? Because I know we're in a data driven world and we all use timers. We all use jump mats. Uh, we measure bar speed. We measure everything. What could you say to that about what improvements you're seeing on the clock or on yeah. uh, whatever app you're using? Yep. So for, for me, I, I, I tend to, I have a guy and you met him, Phil, he does all of our, our strength and conditioning stuff. So I'll give him the programs that we implement. And, and I, I said to him a couple months ago, I said, give me your, your unbiased opinion of, of what's the best part of our strength and conditioning program or our speed program. And he said, to be honest with you, he goes, I, I don't know if I'd say this in public. He goes, but we haven't had one soft tissue injury in six years. And I, you've never heard me say that. And I won't say it like publicly, but I guess I'm going to do it now. Number one, I don't want to jinx myself. And, and number two is that doesn't sound believable. Like if somebody said, well, we've had, you know, two or three and that's awesome. We, we've had zero. We, we've had zero missed snaps because somebody pulled a hamstring. Zero missed snaps because somebody's groin was sore. Now, have we had um, a concussion? Sure. We're way down, but have we had a couple? Have we had a couple ACLs? One, but no soft tissue injuries. So that would be number one. Um, I did a podcast the other day where one of the college coaches that coaches one of the kids that I had in high school um, was saying, I, I, I can't believe how fast he is. I said, well, he spent a lot of time running fast. I mean, that's what we do. And I guess instead of data, I, I utilize – are you winning football games? Are your kids happy? How many kids are in your program? Like we have 130 kids in our small high school involved in football. So when people get on the internet and they start talking about football's in danger because of this and that, not at my school. At my school, we might have to cut kids, which is awful. It, it, it's so they're having fun. And I guess when you're talking about training, nobody really talks about that. They're having fun because they're doing things they've never done before. They're running fast. They're jumping higher. Um, they're not getting hurt and they're enjoying it. They're not at practice for three hours. And you've won a few football games, haven't you? A few. Yep. How many times have you been coach of the year? <laughs> a couple of times, a couple of times. For, but for those players. <laughs> uh I don't know. You realize I can give you as much shit as I want right now. And you can't do anything back because I'm the host. Yes, you're right. You're right. You're right. Going in a, a weird direction here, Dan. Um, one of the things I've observed, and you, you might be, you and Chris are probably the two people that need to answer this question. I have not had a soft tissue injury in the last seven years as well. That happened to coincide with RPR. That's but, awesome. But the um, but people <laughs> said, "Now wait, I I thought Marcellus had some hamstring problems his junior year," and I said, "No, they weren't injuries. They were like weird neural things where he felt tightness without an injury, or he." he literally would lock up a little bit in a race that scared the shit out of him. He would still finish and win. Uh, we would shut him down. An hour later, I said, how bad is it? He said, coach, it's fine. So, so I know there is a brain hamstring connection and it has something to do with survival and fear and governors. Talk to me about that brain hamstring thing. Well, let me, let me throw something in and then Dan can finish this. So Marcellus was going through, he had braces at the time. Remember? Yep. And he was, they were pretty aggressive with the tightening and um, moving things around. Remember that was an issue that he was seeing uh, 
orthodontist every couple of weeks, I think at that point, and they were really pulling pretty hard. And so anytime you put braces on someone, you're realigning the jaw and you're realigning the teeth. And we may blow teeth off as just something to chew it, but when you're, I mean, to show you how fundamental teeth are, your organ development is tied to when your teeth come in. That's how important they are because you're not gonna develop something internally unless you're ready to because you've got the teeth to be able to eat meat or something like that. So I think that's one thing that goes into it. Uh, Dan, do you wanna comment about anything with the jaw and the possibility that moving your jaw around could change your gait cycle or your gait patterns? Absolutely, protraction of your jaw or retraction of your jaw is gonna enhance flexors or extensors. So everything in your body that's controlled by your brain is going to be a synergy between your flexors and extensors, right? So we talk about the so posterior- Slow down, chain. slow down, explain yep. that. You okay, really so if, if I just subtly move my jaw, out and I tuck it, retract, protract it, it's going to have <laughs> an instant impact on my extensor chain or my flexor chain. Okay. I, there's exercises we'll do in the gym where I'm telling kids to protract their jaw because I want their flexors enhanced. I'm telling them to retract their jaw because I want extensors. That's a party trick I do. I'm going to tell people to touch their toes and move their jaw in a certain way and all of a sudden lengthen the hamstrings. So absolutely, can your jaw impact your hamstrings? No question. But there's 50 million other things when you're wired for speed that could, could go on. Threat is definitely one part of it, right? So everything that we'll do in neurology is to limit threat to the brain because once those mechanisms are shut off, all of a sudden you got old ladies flipping cars over. You've got people running world records. They're just reducing threat. And we think it's, oh, they squatted this or, oh, they did this type of plyometric training. Uh, I'm not buying it. And it's your brain and your brain controls everything. So most of my talk was this, this year was on the PMRF or that reflexive part of your brainstem that controls that synergy, flexion, extension. So if you're seeing an issue that maybe it's enhanced flexion, you're going into the part of the brainstem where it's gonna enhance extension, right? So we're balancing that out just like we would if we were in the weight room and we didn't know any better. And we said, okay, that person is quad dominant. We need to strengthen his hamstrings. That's the wrong way to look at it. That is so minimal in the scheme of the brain that you can get much better progress attacking brainstem stuff, visual vestibular, stuff like that. And RPR can, well, I've seen it, so I, I'm being rhetorical here, but with guys that have had this, this tension in their hamstring, coach, I can't run. When did you get hurt? I, I don't think I ever heard it. It's just, it's tight and it hurts. And RPR can interrupt that conversation between the brain and the hamstring. Is that right? Correct. It can. That's one way it can be interrupted. Absolutely. Um, there's, there's a couple different ways I tell people from a proprioceptive standpoint, from a visual standpoint, or a vestibular standpoint. One of those three sensory inputs could be off, or one could be higher than the other, and you need to balance them off. Um, yeah, I, I, RPR for sure. When I came back from Europe, the first time I saw Douglas, I had a major hamstring injury when I went over there. I mean, major. So Douglas put me up on the table and he just crushed me. But I woke up the next morning. I was like, this is ridiculous. And I was, I was very similar to most sprinters. You're wired for speed. So every little thing, I, I love it when sprinters say to me, I, I can't run today. It's a little too cold. Okay. I'm okay with that. Okay. Go sit over there. Cause you're not going to put yourself in that situation because you know your body. So the faster you are, the more you kind of feel what your body can let go and when it's ready and all this stuff. So I know they call them prima donnas, but they're prima donnas for a reason because they're pretty in tuned with their body and how it flies. And I know? think I'm going to add to that, Dan, um, last couple of people I asked, what are things that you see someone walking around or what are attributes of, of a freak athlete? 
and I never really got a good answer from anyone. But I'm going to give you I'm going to give you something right now. They're really in tune with their body. They know what they know what things feel. They know what's on. They know what's off. They know when they're on. They know when they're off. They know exactly what's going on with their body. And I've never seen someone who was really fast that had no sensation in their body whatsoever. So after an exercise, I'll ask, how did that feel? And they'll go, well, I felt this and I felt this. I know that athletes in tune with their body compared to someone who goes, what'd you feel in that exercise? Nothing was I supposed to feel something. Yeah, huh. maybe we need to go back and do some really basic reflexive <laughs> pattern stuff so you can start to feel something in your body and you know what's going on. And, um, and some and people- Like Dan said, call them prima donnas. They aren't prima donnas, right. they are. And a lot of people say, you know, you're, I see your kids come up and tell you stuff all the time and they're complaining about stuff. So they're not com complaining. We're having a communication with what's going on with their body. You know, they're telling me what they feel so I can make better decisions on what to do either in our workout or am I pulling you from a track meet? To, so an, untrained, to an untrained coach, it sounds like complaining. To a guy who knows what's going on with speed, it's, it's a person who knows exactly what I feel like when I fly right. It, Charlie Francis used to say, looks right, flies right. Um, I, I don't know. They just know. They just know. They which, do. Causes, which leads to a problem in coaching in general. You know, I say that most coaches came from a grinder background. They outwork people. They showed up first. They loved their coach. They resented the prima donnas. And because they got a lot out of the hard work, they are hard work addicts. And so they have a hard time because they're not from the same place that you are, Dan, from a speed thing. And so they have a real hard time dealing with what I call the cats of the world. Have you yeah. found that to be true? Oh my gosh. So I have a, and someone called me last week and they want to talk to my distance coach at the high school. He's awesome. He's a math teacher. He's been the distance coach. When I was the head track coach there, he was my assistant. He's the most loyal, hardworking. He makes great distance runners. So when I started, it's right along the lines when we were talking to Chris back in the day, we were having guys sprint, sprint, sprint. Even his distance guys were coming in and doing fly 10s, fly 20s. It was great. But he would still, I, I, we got to grind. We got to get our miles. We got to get them out. And I'm like, okay, um, I'm going home. Well, you can't go home. You're the head coach. Why? I coach jumpers, sprinters. Anybody who runs fast or throws far, I coach them and they're done. Well, you only practice for 20 minutes. See ya. I'm going home. And we'd walk off the field. And as I walk off the field, he's yelling at me, going, I got to stay here. I go, that's your own fault. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but you're the head coach. I go, you got the keys. You can lock the gate. So we'd walk we'd walk home. And as I'm walking to my car, the lacrosse team's practicing. Now, in Arondacoy, it's an Indian name. Lacrosse rules. They had more, We have more high school lacrosse wins than any other team in the entire country. When I took over as a track coach, and I'm going to be politically correct. We had all the kids in the band, all the kids in the choir, and then a couple other kids. And then all of a sudden we started winning. And the lacrosse team, they were winning, but they weren't winning as much. And we'd be walking off the field, 45 minutes of practice, 20 minutes of practice. The lacrosse coach would come over to me and go, what are you doing? He goes, you guys win every year. He goes, and you practice for 15 minutes. I'm like, I, I ain't got anything else for him. Well, go home. And he'd be looking at me. Well, they practice for three hours. Nobody ever caught on. I, I still have the same argument with my distance coach who still sprints his kids, who still loves it all, but we still argue. Why, why are you leaving in 20 minutes? I said, because I have nothing else to do. Speed is a very short energy system. I, I don't know what to tell you. We're done. We're not training speed anymore. So it's, it's a constant battle, but I laugh. I love it. I love getting under his skin about it. But so... Always got to throw in the fart licks. Always got to go back to the fart licks. It's, it's unbelievable. Like I, I'll be pulling out, driving home. I'll be coming back to go get dinner and they're still practicing. It's my team. And they're still practicing. I'm like, this is insane. My, my I, coach has license plates that say fart lick. <laughs> and I love him to death. He's one of my favorite people because he's the most loyal, hardworking guy I know. But it's just, it's a different philosophy. And that's, 
it's the way it goes. And it doesn't bother me when kids complain about being this or that, or, and they're in tune with their body. I've, I've heard it for years and other coaches telling me you can't do that and win. Well, okay. You know, when I do is doing RPR with our football team, we had the same thing where kids would come off the field and say, this is off and that's off. And the athletic trainers would try and come in and try and do something. The kids would tell them, no, I'm not hurt. So I don't need you. I just know that this isn't working right. Can you reset me? You know, cause they got pads on and all that. So it's always an interesting trade-off that they know they're not injured because I, I like the coaches that preach. There's a difference between hurt and injury. You can play hurt, but when you're injured, that means you can't play. No, it's just, you know, something is off and you want it back on. And, you know, in a game, maybe you're too tired to do it yourself or you just can't reach it with all your stuff on and I can. Yeah. One of the things that I think was an aha moment in my career is when you start getting into the therapy side and I have an opportunity to do that because in my gym, there's a, there's a chiropractor who does neurology. So it's been awesome. Dr. Lucky, he's great. So I, I noticed that when kids come in and they're like, Oh, I hurt my knee or I hurt this or hurt that. The, the first thing I say to them is, okay, what have you been doing? And they'll tell me all the things they're doing, all their corrective exercises they're doing, and they'll go on for hours. I say, okay, well, here's the thing. We're not doing any of that, just so you know. And I tell their parents, I'm not going to do anything like that. So we're going to start with, here's what you've did. I wrote it all down. We're not doing any of that. Because if that worked, you wouldn't be here. And normally I get kids after two or three weeks, they have no change. They're doing their banded exercises or whatever they're doing. When you're talking about neurology, you're talking about hitting the target in the bullseye and it's going to change probably instantly. And if not, it's going to be pretty close to instantly. So the first thing is, is your evaluation is what have you been doing? It, and I'm going to be honest with you, it wasn't too much different when a kid came into my gym and said, I want to get faster and I want to do this. Well, what have you been doing? Well, I've been squatting. Well, we ain't doing that. And that's how it started. So I'm going to do whatever you're, you're not doing because I, I had this conversation with, do you remember the sprinter? Was it, is it Spearman? Spearman? The well, I'll remember Wallace. Yeah, yes. I remember that. Remember? Yeah, that was back in the, when we were in DC. Yes. Pretty he, fast. Yeah. He was telling me all the things that he was doing. And I go, well, if you came to train with me, we wouldn't do any of those things. Well, I, I got to do my A skips and B skips. And I'm, okay, why? If, if you're not getting faster, why, why are you doing the same thing? And that's, that's kind of how it starts. And with neurology, as you start going down these rabbit holes, it's insane. You, you can work on an elbow or a knee and you're not even, the other part of neurology is when, when, when people come to you and say, fix me, I can't do that. I'm not a therapist, but I know neurology. So if I'm someone has elbow pain, I don't go anywhere near their elbow. So I'm not really, I'm, I'm doing all the things I've learned as a strength coach and a speed coach and fixing your elbow without even touching it. We, I had that, it, it happened this weekend with a high, high level college coach. We're working on a guy. And I said, listen, don't, don't go anywhere near his ankle. Don't touch it because you'll get in trouble. Go to his eyes. Oh my God, this worked. Okay, good. See, you're, you're an eye specialist. You've made him look a different way and his, his ankle doesn't hurt anymore. It's funny when people, like I, I had this happen in the last couple of weeks where a guy brought his son and he's a soccer player and says he needs to be faster. You know, I did my normal pre-videotape and I sat down and said, here's, here's what we need to fix. Here's what's off. And then the next week, the dad was videotaping too. And he's one of those guys. And he ran completely different because he kept asking, well, how many weeks is this going to take? And I, he looked at it and goes, wow, he looks completely different. I said, yeah, I told you it would take him one time. If, if we're doing the right exercises, you make immediate changes because the brain has accepted that and said, this is a better pattern than the other pattern. Yep. You've reduced that threat right away. Yep. So then the dad got up and he goes, 
well, I wonder how it is on the clock. And I said, well, it's 30 out. I'm not going to go out. We're not going to go out and time fly tens when it's 30 degrees outside. But he put three inches on his vertical jump in two weeks. And it's like, what more can I do than that? He goes, well, what about right. that mat? Does it work? And I said, it's what everyone uses. It's hard to cheat a jump mat. Well, it's three inches regardless, right? So it's, yeah. you know what I mean? Let's say I measured it with ice cubes. It's three more ice cubes, whatever. It's more. <laughs> That's one of the things that I struggle with with people. They're all, they're all, well, what about this? And what about, just watch it. Did it change? Yes. Like, and I talk about this with you, Chris, all the time. People, oh, it's voodoo. Yep. yep. Whatever you want to call it, it's voodoo. Yep. That's what it is. And, then my did, uh, and people got pissed at me for saying it was voodoo. I was down in Jasper, Indiana, doing a RPR education class about how being in the right mental state, you know, your body, your brain connects with your body and, and back and forth that you can't learn if you're physically shut down. And I kept saying voodoo and someone got mad that, why do you keep calling it voodoo? You know, is it really voodoo? I said, well, maybe. <laughs> well, you wouldn't believe me if I told you anyway. <laughs> Isn't, isn't voodoo a lot more fun to say? I mean, maybe I'm in back <laughs> sticking pins in a dollar or something. Like that. <laughs> we're sensory motor creatures. So if you want to impact the brain and you want to learn, we're going to learn through sensory input, right? It, it, it's just the way we were wired. I, I mean, I, in my presentation, I, I talk about, you know, if, if David Blaine was up there doing, making the Statue of Liberty disappear, and you're, everybody's going, my God, that's magic. That's crazy. Until you had the opportunity to talk to David Blaine. And he, and he says, here's how I did it. I did this, 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 this. Oh, okay. Well, I could have done that. Right. Now it's not magic anymore. It's your knowledge of what just happened. That's science. You, you have to know what's going on. And then you make those changes. Then it's not magic anymore. It's not voodoo. You know, that's how Harry Houdini got famous is he would go to magicians shows back in the 20s when that was a big thing and he would yell out how they were doing their tricks and so then they said all right what are you going to do big guy and so he had all these escape things but now we find out that he knew every locksmith in every town and paid them to shut up and the whole thing and it, and it was all a gag but people yeah. couldn't figure it out <clears throat> and I used to tell my, uh, my chemistry students that there is no magic in the world there's only deception and science and whether whether you're deceiving people and tricking them like houdini did or or there's an explanation and what exactly. you're saying is there's an explanation to the voodoo and the explanation requires knowledge knowledge of the human body and the brain and and some people are afraid of that it's vastly complex i get it but sometimes it's so simple that why not spend a few extra minutes reading about it to understand it and see the impact it can make on movement. I mean, think about it. We walk or we run and most of that stuff is reflexive in nature, right? I talk about it in my presentation, but yet we train the voluntary part all the time and we're really good at it. I mean, we can lift weights and we can do all these things. Why not train what the body really responds to, which is sensory input? And, and people are starting to get it now. They're starting to. I love the stuff that you guys talk about with vision. Um, Chris made the, the statement in an article that he wrote that, that kids that have bad eyesight are never fast. And, and I, you know, I, it was an aha moment to me. But then I also remembered that I never wore glasses as a high school athlete. I asked when I finally started wearing glasses when I was 30, I asked if, if, if this was something that had come on recently and the doctor laughed. He said, no, you were born with this. And what's so crazy about my vision is that if I take off my glasses, the ground looks like it's way far away from me. Like I'm all of a sudden seven foot tall. With my glasses, the ground comes up closer to me. And the amount of fear that that must have caused in me as I sprinted or ran without knowing it must have been real. Absolutely. And again, it just, it goes down to something simple. You can talk about visual, you could talk about vestibular, you could talk about proprioception, but it simply comes down to the threat. If you find ways to reduce threat, whether it's vision, whether it's vestibular proprioception, you're going to get cleaner movement. It's just the, the reality. Athletes, 
The best athletes are <laughs> reckless when they sprint, reckless when they play. They, they are, there is no governor. So one of the guys who, who's the, one of the leading researchers on concussions, the guy from um, Cincinnati, I forget what his name is. Um, he's outstanding. And he talks about the eyes all the time in your periphery. So if you see a hit coming, you're not going to get a concussion. If you can't see it coming because it's out of your periphery, you're more likely to get a concussion. Should we work on our periphery? Because as you expand your periphery or you train and you grind people into the ground, your periphery does this. It just shrinks. That's just what it is. If you're sprinting all the time, your eyes are in one frame. You're not, you're not expanding them. Shouldn't your training then try to expand the periphery just to make sure that we can feel things? Um, I, I used to talk to high school sprinters all the time. Can't you feel the guy next to you? No. What do you, so well, why didn't I train his periphery? Just so they start to understand it, reduce the threat, run faster. It's that simple. Wait, Dan, we got a question popping up here. Yep. Since we're talking about vision, um, what are the best drills to train eyes to reduce threat? How can we extend periphery? So, so training your periphery in a training session, whether it's sprinting, whether it's weightlifting, whatever you're doing, if you can set your periphery before you train, right? So I'm, I can see my fingers outside here. Okay, right here is where I see them. I start to exercise. I start to do whatever philosophy I believe in. I go back in between sets and I'm checking this. I can't see it anymore. Well, you're done. You're, you're fried. Okay. Or I did an exercise and whoa, I expanded my periphery. Keep going. Keep going. So it's a way you can use periphery training for auto regulation. That's one way to use it. The second part of vision for me that is a game changer is a convergence test tells you a lot about what's going on in the brainstem, right? So we're working with someone right now. I, I don't know if I can, I, I'll hold this, this picture up and see if I can. Um, We'd rather see pictures of your hall of fame plaques. <laughs> you so funny. Is your dog going to make an appearance? <laughs> he might. All right. I remember the guy's name from Cincinnati. It's either Herb Tarlick or Les Nessman. All right. Can you guys see that? So this is one of the tests we did with a, with a hurdler. Okay. So we're, we're finding out. I know that what, girl. Yes, you do. So her right eye doesn't converge. And I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Yeah. She, okay. She got, she got the googly eye. Okay. So th that's 90% of the population. But if you take a look at her run, and this is what, Tony, this is what Chris and I are going to start to merge together here. So if you take biomechanics and you merge neurology with it, and you're talking about these neural mechanics, you can start to create drills that you'll see a change in biomechanics just by a, by a visual drill, right? So now we have a convergence issue on the right-hand side. If you watch her run, she has an issue in extension of her right arm. So instead of me telling her, okay, we're, we don't want to extend your right arm so far, we're going to start to work on the brainstem that controls that flexion extension synergy in her body. Does that make sense? So a simple convergence drill or a smooth pursuit to a certain area to activate a certain part of the brain is going to now make that change for me. And that's how we start to implement these things together. Um, what exactly would you do for that girl? What exactly? Where would you well, start? So one of the things that you do is you evaluate. So we'll have her hurdle. Then we'll do a different eye position. Have her hurdle again. If I notice a change, boom, that's an exercise she's doing. It'd be very similar to say, if you're watching somebody from a structural standpoint, and you say, okay, I don't think they're getting to their hand. I don't think they utilize their hamstrings. So we're going to put them in the weight room. Or we're going to do this, 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 or we're going to train their hamstrings this way. I'm looking at it more from what controls the extensors and what controls the flexors in your brainstem, right? So you have this PMRF that's responsible. The pontine is responsible for your extensors. The midbrain is the flexors. So right now we're in her midbrain working hard on her flexors. So she's doing a convergent exercise with her eyes down into the left. Then she's running. 
So we've had some, some changes, but we constantly evaluate it as we do it. And then we start to stack other sensory input, okay? Whether it be vibration, whether it be, I put a band in a certain part of a, uh, of a pronation that I'm seeing, if I'm noticing some type of brain failure in that movement, rather than just saying, well, you, you have no stiffness. Well, stiffness is as much as we can train it from absorbing force or plyometrics, stiffness is also set up by perceived brain threat. So you want to have that when the foot hits the ground, the co-contraction of the, the calf muscle so that the ankle can then be free to move about the cabin. If you have, if that stiffness is off, you don't have stiffness, right? So, so I attack it from the brainstem. I attack it from the visual system, whereas most people will attack it with a corrective exercise. You know, I, I think that the whole periphery thing is interesting because if you go through and you, you do vision tests with people, uh, there are places where you see two. Uh, and you can move your finger around and have people move their eyes. And, you know, like for me, if I put my finger here at about 10 o'clock and to my upper left, I always see two. And that's just a spot. I, I think I knocked my head crooked playing football. Uh, but there's always two here. So whenever you see two of something come in, you're expected one, that's an automatic threat. So for, in a, how that would carry over into football probably is... Don't throw me the ball. Don't line me up on the right-hand side and have me run fades because when that football is about 15 feet from me, I'm going to see two footballs. And instead of being able to catch it, now I have to defend myself from it because this ball is coming at me really fast. And it all happens in, in a split second. But for that moment where you have to defend instead of perform, that's, that's where you make the mistakes. Sometimes you'll catch it just out of practice, but sometimes you won't. And you're, you wonder why. Boy, Johnson's got stiff fingers when he goes to that side. And it's like, there's probably something going on in their vision. Kind of like the Pittsburgh Steelers. Did anyone watch that game last night? Yeah. They were playing for real. Those guys were playing for real last they night. They were hitting. Cincinnati was Ooh, hitting that's people. football. Yeah. And they're talking about the Steelers receivers have dropped, what, 38 passes this year? The mo <laughs> By far the most in the league. I wonder what their vision is because those guys would not be playing in the NFL if they couldn't catch the football. They wouldn't even made it on their college team if they couldn't catch. What happened to all of a sudden that some of the best receivers in the NFL suddenly dropped passes? I'm going to bet that there's something going on with their vision. There, there's probably some serious neural things going on where stuff's not right and, okay. and, and they can't make that play. And you know, there's, one, there's one other thing too. Of course, there's the vision thing, like you guys say, but, but they were talking about Johnson, who has more drops than four entire teams in the NFL. And they said that he doesn't drop balls in practice. So the whole thing about fear being and not being a state of performance, that some people perceive games as fun, but for some people, they get all ratcheted up and there's a, there's a fear response. Would you agree? Yeah, and I'd, I'd go further and call it almost like a calibration. So you lose this calibration when fear comes or when some type of compensation hits or some type of your environment changes. And we'll do a drill a lot of times. We'll put somebody in a sprinter stance where they're up on the balls of their feet and they're standing nice and tall and, and they're staggered like this, right? Standing on the balls of their feet. And I'll do, I call it a, the, the finger nose. And I'm, I'm putting my hand out here and they're touching their nose and looking straight ahead and touching my finger. And they're, they're doing it in all different aspects of their visual field, right? And then they'll do it to the other way. So I'm holding a hand up over here and they're looking straight ahead. They touch their nose and then they hit. So you'd be amazed how some kids, one side is completely, they can't see anything. So I make them calibrate it. So let's say I went here and I missed. Well, I'm going to tell them they missed. Here's my finger over here. I'm going to make them do it until they touch it and just calibrate that part of your brain. Make sure your, your vision is intact in that visual field. It's amazing what happens. That increases performance, you name it, across the board, just by visually calibrating your surroundings. Would you do that with all athletes? Yes. We do it in our warm-up. 
we do it before, like as a wide receiver coach, I do it before our individual practice, right? So if we're going to catch the ball, there's two things I do. We'll do that and we'll do infinity walks. And we can talk about that in a minute, but um, those are like go-to drills for, for sensory motor stuff for me, for, for the eyes. The eyes touch 70% of your brain, maybe more, right? So you have to train your eyes. So let me get this straight. You yourself will put your finger up. Mm -hmm. Or their partner. I have kids oh, work with partners, partner right? Yep. Um, that makes sense. Okay. Yep. Stand on the side of them and, and just hold your finger up in various places. Right. And it, you can even do it, like Chris said, with, with someone who wants to, like, I'll, I'll put them in this position. Their eyes are up. And now they have to calibrate from this position. If they can't catch the ball here coming over their shoulder. So we're making sure we're clearing that whole entire visual field. And if they have a point where they're not touching my finger, we're going to stay on that point until they visually calibrate it. Love it. And we do that with, with some level two RPR stuff as well, where we're going to get the, get the physical aspects where you're feeling strong. We're letting the body know it's strong and put your eyes in those different positions, whether it's movement or positions or peripheries. Uh, and yep. we've had some pretty big changes just by doing that. And I think everyone's been to a clinic where these are miraculous vision things happen. And it's like, well, why is that? Well, because the brain and the body are connected and they feed to each other. It's not just one way. There's a feed system that goes all the way around. It's a loop. Uh, and if we can get that to go and the body feels strong in that position, that eye position, maybe it will give the vision a better chance to, to do its job. How about this? You don't talk about crazy with brainstem stuff. So if you start feeding um, different cranial nerve information to the one that's struggling. So let's say you have, you're doing that convergence test, right, Tony? And I, I'm, I'm in this position and I'm making that, well, let's go here, my right eye converge hard and down, right? And I'm looking at my finger and it's blurry. I'll feed it more cranial stimulation. I'll start snapping in their ear because the cochlear part, all of a sudden they're like, I can see that a little bit better. Okay, good. So I've just fed a different avenue of more sensory stacks. And this is when people tell me, well, you did this neural trick and how, if it, does it last? Well, I'll tell you what, I love JL's answer. JL's answer is, well, if you are thirsty and you drink water, well, how the hell long does that last? You're going to have to drink again at some point. So if you give it more sensory information and you feed good with something that's bad, you're going to get a better result. Right. And I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I think JL is like the story for TFC. He's a dude that has come from the height of his profession of powerlifting and has come full circle to understand speed and how there really isn't much of a correlation. Imagine that. And imagine Chris was the guy who told him that. So you know how JL threatens that he punches, he punches people in the face? He really yeah. does. I can't tell you how many times on our first meeting, he threatened to punch me in the face. It started off with, you know, I really took a step away when I built my own gym in my garage and I dragged my power rack out to the, to the garbage for the garbage men to pick up. And he goes, bro, you're giving me anxiety. And then I talked about why squatting wasn't great. And Cal was right there. And he goes, I'm going to fucking punch you in the face. <laughs> I believe it. And I said, well, let's do it then. Get it over with so we can finish this conversation. I'm probably going to dodge you, but let's do it. And so to see that JL went and JL was the best at West side barbell and he knows that system as well as anyone on the planet. And for him to go as far as he has, uh, in just the mentality, his personality change. I mean, when I first met him, he was beginning, but that was one intense dude. Like everything was, I mean, he was the Hulk. He was the Hulk. He was the Hulk and Thor Ragnarok where he, he could have a conversation and be funny and stuff like that. But it was just a click away from, he's going to punch you in the face. So anyway, I don't know how we got on jail, but. No, but I think, I, I think when you talk about TFC and what, what it offers people is, is it, it gives people that Avenue to come over and check it out and say, Hey, maybe it's not all about pounding in the weight room and there's different ways to do it. Um, and, and, and I think we've seen that 
what are we on around 15, Tony? S 16. We've seen a bunch of people have a bunch of different ideas on different things. Um, and we've really run the gamut from Olympic lifts with Boo last night to isometrics with, with Alex and Tara. Uh, and Dan and I had the conversation today about you know, what Boo's response was with isometrics. And, you know, we don't fully agree with what he said. And I, and I think that's one thing that people who just listen and aren't in as deep as we are is Alex just doesn't do isometrics. You know, he does a lot of other things, just like Tony, you don't just do fly tens. Exactly. <laughs> and I that's think, what I'm known for. And, and, and I think people like to tie, like to put people in boxes and say, this is what you do. And Corfus, you're just a mad scientist in, you know, whatever. But it's much more than that. And, and I think that's one thing about TFC that I think we built, Tony, was we're breaking down boxes. There's no, there shouldn't be any boxes. And, and when Dan brings neuro stuff in, and people say, well, Dan's a neuro guy. No, guys, Dan lived with Mel Siff. So the guy who knew Olympic lifting better than anyone on the planet, maybe in the history of the game, Dan was who? Mel Siff, Mel right? Siff, absolutely. I mean, he but wrote super training. Here's what I tell people. You can weight train. You can do all the stuff you want. You just have to understand that there's unintended consequences to everything that you do. So you have to understand what negative impact it's going to have. So when, when people talk about isometrics, I, I want people to look at it this way. There's, there's a couple different kinds of isometrics. There's an overcoming and there's a yielding. To me, if you're overcoming, that's conscious. If you're yielding, that's subconscious. That's more neurally. I'm in, right? So, so when you're talking about a yielding strategy in isometrics, it gives your body more options. Explain the difference for me. Okay, so if I'm overcoming something, I am holding it at the same joint ankle, but I'm trying to make sure that it doesn't move and I'm pushing it up, right? So we're going to overcome that object that's not moving. Right? So that'd be like a, a, a bar on your back. A bar on my back that I'm trying to press up. But it, it's not, not moving. moving. Correct. But I'm trying to press but it, it up. It is a push isometric. Right. So it's concentric. Gotcha. That would be a term, right? So concentric to me means conscious. I control it. Yielding is that bar is taking me down. And you're finding any way you can to prevent you from being crushed to death by the bar. Okay. So now we're talking about reflexive stabilization. We're talking about a completely different platform. So when your foot hits the ground, when you're running, that's the mechanisms we want. It's a, it's a yielding, okay? The yielding gives you more options. That is a subconscious thing. So there's your neural strategy in isometrics in just that alone, right? So when people start to talk about isometrics, I want them to be real clear about what we're actually talking about. So that, that, that's number one. The unintended- Can I ask a question first? Yep. So I'm, tr I'm still trying to um, get it straight in my head. So Chris, when you put people in the wide stance, and they're holding a bar, like in a lunge type stance, they're holding a bar. Yeah, they're trying not to get sucked into the ground. It's sucking them into the ground. You want them to get sucked into the yeah, ground. Yeah, that's right. And that's, why, and that's why I make it 30 seconds is because eventually you are gonna get sucked into the ground. And what did Alex call that? Uh, he didn't. Okay, I thought you said there were push and pull isometrics. Okay, you're I, pulling yourself into the ground then. Yeah as opposed to a push, which would be concentric. So yeah. what happens in the, in the pole is you're starting to share stress. That's what you want. You want to share stress. And, and so that's why I fluctuate between the two. Um, we'll do some, in fact, we do it in the same workout. You'll go from how hard can I press into the bar for five seconds, and then I'm going to overcome you. So one thing that I like doing now to tie in feet and everything is we've got the pin set with a bar in it and you press up into the pin and you lock it just like Alex showed. And then after that, you step into the other rack and now you've got the, a shit ton of weight on there and you've got to not collapse in that foot and go down, but you will collapse. And I think I've made that point on two different occasions uh, on these talks where 
Hank Krasenhoff talked about if you aren't losing in the battle, you're really not training eccentric or isometric. You're really not changing anything. If you're trying to push that weight up, again, you're going into conscious. I'm thinking about pushing that up. All of a sudden now, you're, you're going to develop tightness and muscles. You're going to develop a whole bunch of compensation patterns because you're consciously thinking about that contraction as opposed to just surviving, sharing the stress and letting it yield out. And it, that is such a critical foundation to think about when you're talking about isometrics. And then that's a connect the dot moment for me with neurology is that's what the brain, that's what it needs to have uh, the most overused word now in performance is robust, right? To be a more robust mover, that's what you need. You need that yielding and sharing of the stress to create more options. So when, you're, when your foot hits the ground, if you want your ankle to be able to pronate, supinate, get to your rocker and do all that other stuff, you have to have some good load sharing up top. And I think Cal makes that point too, where he talks about, I've got girls that can hold 365. You know, they took a lot of fails. And so if you got a good weight room, and this is one thing, you know, one of these, our kids are so polite today things. If you don't hear banging, that means people, you don't have enough weight on that bar because they've got it. They've got to land that thing. And it sometimes it comes down fast. Now you've got protections there, uh, but that's what you're looking to do. Um, and again, that's, you know, the magic of what Cal has created is, you know, you can say, well, you lose proprioception when you do isometrics, but not if I'm going out and doing a French contrast and I'm doing overspeed jumps, I'm jumping over hurdles and I'm doing one foot stuff, you know, that erases that, that concern. And or I if think you're on one leg, you're load sharing on the one leg, your other leg is doing what it needs to do. Yeah. That's reflexive that, that's training. Re that's reflexive training. And that's why I've gotten away from put having people put their back leg up on a pad or you know you know on top of the the ledge or whatever the hell it is you know i want you to use that leg to balance and, and find stuff and it gets interesting because every every time it looks different as you fatigue you find a new way to deal with that and so when we take that onto the field you've given your there's more options for you to move safely um you're creating options for when you move if any gets scary. So I, I don't know if you guys saw the slide that I put in there, but we're not designed I like perfectly to, to stand up. Standing up for us is ridiculous. If you think about it, our, where our body is five times the length of the, our support system, which is our feet, right? So with that being said, you have to know that there's a huge reflexive um, subconscious control of those posture muscles. And I don't think anybody addresses them in the weight room. That's why I like the Alex and Tara stuff so much, because I'm actually, you're actually trying to extend into that, into that bar, or whatever your, your limiter is or what your barrier is. And I think we're so used to getting impacted with the bar. Like nothing kills me more than going into a weight room. I don't care where it is. And I see some sophomore or freshman with way too much weight on the back. And it literally looks like they're getting crushed to death, but they're finding ways to stand up with it. And it's like, look what you're doing. This, there's no carry over here. You can say that you squatted and you can give them the t-shirt, but it, it's brutal. It's not right. And so like I get pigeonholed as the anti-squat guy. I'm not anti-squat. I'm anti crushing kids to death, wrecking their spines, creating new joints and extra flexibility or extra joint range of motion in your spine that when you're 50 years old, all of a sudden your disc in that place is gonna hurt. And no one's ever gonna bring it back to, well, you shouldn't have squatted 405 in high school when you only weighed 160. You know, nobody takes it back that far, but that's where it comes from. And I've seen that countless times where you have kids that have lived in the weight room and you put them on the table. And this is something that uh, I think Dan and I are different that we actually put people on the table and test things. Like, is this muscle truly working or are you creating a compensation pattern? Um, and, and you see vertebrae that have hypermobility where it's a fulcrum. One of your vertebrae becomes a fulcrum. And I saw it on a girl the other day who's been going to some place in Naperville 
and uh, they're great at squats and deadlifts and all that. And then I looked at the looked at her from the side, and I filmed it. And I said, "Look at this divot in your back. It literally looks like you've got a shallow V for a spine." And then her dad goes, "Yeah, but she she pulled two seventy five. And I said, "But at what cost?" She's living an extension. That's right. And so. Well, she's not going to use that when she jumps because when she's playing volleyball, you're not going to get to that divot <laughs> and pull from that point. It, or it, if you're starting, yeah, if you're if you're already starting an extension and you'd like to have some extension, you're shot. You got no shot. I, I, it, it's so simple to to throw somebody. See, the other part of it too is is a lot of times we think we see something. In, in the way somebody moves or this or that. But in reality, we have to make sure with when they interact with the ground that it's what we really think it, what we see, yeah. right? So you have to interview the nervous system. That's why I like to put people on a table. That's why, you know, and, and I've been talking to Chris about this. That's the, the genius behind square one is they're going to figure out exactly what joint is intolerant of the load when it hits the ground, right? Because a lot of times we'll look at something and we'll say, okay, well, the foot did this when your right foot hit the ground. Well, when you're hitting the ground, your entire body is hitting the ground. Every There's 218 joint actions that are going on that are being, you know, gravity is kicking their ass. And who knows what joint action it is and in what plane of motion is intolerant of that load. We just think we see it because it's maybe swamped out by the ground forces and in, in running. In reality, you get them on the table, interview the nervous system, and it's, oh, it's their right elbow, not their left foot. Now, most people in the audience are, are not, you know, are, are a hundredth of the level of you guys neurologically and all that kind of stuff. But maybe they have some RPR yep. stuff in their background. What, what are, are there some real primitive things that you would tell beginners in neurology to check for when somebody got on a table? Um, one of the things is primitive reflexes, right? So when we start talking about the mobility of your foot or even your hand, see this ball here, it's got spikes on it, right? So I spend a lot of time on the tactile sensation of hands and feet, right? So we'll, we'll rub our feet out and there's going to be a sensitive part from the right to the left, right? The one that's more sensitive, I'm on it. Because if you think about, you have to be able to feel in order to move. So if you want range of motion, if you want all these things, the tactile component is at the bottom of that triangle in that pyramid of sensory development. You have to have it, right? And, so, feet, and feet are supposed to be every bit as tactile as hands. And, and they're not. Put right? them in coffins right. all our life. And, and so they're like dead. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I, and, I, and I don't understand why this doesn't happen, but I, I think when people hear me speak about this, they'll be like, oh yeah, that sounds great, but you know, where do I go? Well, there's a lot of courses that are out there to give you a basic understanding. One of the courses that I offer right now is this IP motor pattern. So it talks about the stages of development for motor and, and, and sensory milestones, right? So one of the things, and it's crazy, is, is this ball. is working the tactile component. Like if you have a shoulder issue, Try rubbing your hand out on one of these. And all of a sudden you'll find out is this hand, if it's this shoulder, will be more sensitive. I rub it out a little bit, boom. All of a sudden my shoulder feels a little bit better because that communication between my hand and the right side of my brain is now functioning correctly. It's that simple. But, you know, people see it and they go, well, that's not normal stuff. So once again, the tactile hand stuff and foot stuff are stuff that you can do with your kids, all your kids all the time. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right, Dan, we got to get back to questions here. Okay. Uh, from B Brad Dixon. Do you think neural aspect or training is almost absent in the strength and conditioning field? I think we yeah. kind of answered that, but go ahead. To make Absolutely. Sure I mean, you, you take a look at most of its voluntary muscle contractions. That's what we spend time on. Would love to know more about the infinity circles and your football warm up. Okay, so we'll use infinity walks in a variety of different ways. What I found out recently is that lady lives in my backyard. She's from Rochester, New York. It's awesome. I can't wait to go visit her. We've talked through email a few times. It is a multimodal sensory stimulation that gets your brain ready to learn, ready to move. Um, 
it's it's weight shifting it's uh vor it's it, it, it takes all the senses puts them into a drill great to do before um before any type of individual period it's great to do as a wake-up drill and the book let's see infinity walks deborah stumbeck great book and you can amp those up uh you can change, you know, you can, you can run them. I started using them for agility and that's become my main agility. Yeah. That automatic exercise. weight shift with your, with the gaze stabilization, huge in terms yep. of communicating with both hemispheres. And so then we move eyes around and then I hook you up to the 1080 and I pull you back fast and then you go back out. And so now I like to accelerate things because I think you learn faster when things are accelerated. And I know a lot of people say slow is better, but I've been doing some stuff with some, some musicians uh, and the importance of speed in learning. Um, it's not for my playing guitar, it's we were on this think tank thing and trying to learn acqu skill acquisition. And there's some musicians who, you know, they don't play guitar, so we don't have a lot to talk about. They play the timpani and the trombone, so it's like, yeah, well, what about Pete Townsend? What do you think of him? You know, it, we don't have those conversations, but uh, about the importance of speed and how they're claiming that if you go really slow, that's good, but you can actually learn faster with something as finite or as specific as playing an instrument uh, by going fast. And it was, it's been a really interesting dialogue uh, about that. And be, of course, they want to see it from the gate perspective with what I do with the 1080. And of course, I want to learn to play like Eddie Van Halen. So I take it from the music perspective and we've been going back and forth on that. Absolutely, like sound, adding a metronome to it to move faster, to understand those rhythms and beats and, and yeah. Now, Chris, the uh, Infinity Run, would the goat drill that Cal talked about be the advanced version of that or no? Yeah. See, Cal just likes to rename things. He's truly Thomas Edison, where he takes everyone else's stuff and he renames it into his and then puts oh, his Edison, name. Oh, Edison was such a dick, wasn't he? <laughs> so remember that TFC presentation I gave where I compared Cal with Thomas Edison? I'm dead on. I love the Cal <laughs> to death, but that's Cal. Now, after reading that book about Edison, that is not a compliment, Cal. Well, I'll tell you, the infinity walks, you can run them, you can walk them, you can crawl them, you can go backwards, forwards, you name it, you could farmers carry, you can do whatever you think you want to do. I, I, I've done it for wide receivers where they're focused on a point and I'm throwing them a ball each time they come around. So now they have to work on their hand eye coordination, ton of different ways. Um, sky's the limit. Uh, so this is from Wade. Uh, guys, just want to say thanks for all this. I'm not only learning so much, but confirming things I've been implementing this past year. Started at Wichita and Dallas TFC last year, and it's been a crazy fun journey since. It's been fun for us, too. Yeah, thanks, Wade. We appreciate it. And then um, Wade also asked, Dan, the training you tweeted about today, would that be the best place to dive into the neural world? I think it's a great start, the motor patterns course, yeah. Because it really brings you back to, you know, when we talk about vision, well, the first thing that we develop vision for is in our brainstem when we're belly on ground and our eyes go up and all of a sudden our extensor chain, hmm, extensor chain. I like that. Sounds like I could run fast if I had an extensor chain. You know, there's, there's so many different avenues when it comes to that. But yeah, the IP motors patterns class is awesome for that. Um, I think square one is a great start for proprioceptive stuff. Um, you know, I, I look at it like this, if you're talking about rehab or you're talking about performance, and I think Boo said this yesterday, I, I don't really care, but I can tell you this in rehab, I believe it's a bottom up approach. Okay. And in performance, it's a top down approach. I want you to think about that for a minute, because we got to have both. When I say top down, I'm talking about brain stem and down. When we're talking about bottom up, we're talking about the feet up structurally. Okay those things are married together. It's just one gets left out a lot. I would like to have an aside here and say that I'm disappointed nobody caught my Les Nessman Herb Tarlick joke from WKRP in Cincinnati. <laughs> WKRP. You know, I, it actually rang a bell. I just couldn't picture it. 
But uh, yeah, WKRP was definitely uh, one of the great sitcoms of all time. <laughs> I, I was often uh, 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 people have said that I was a lot like Johnny Fever back in the day. I can see that if you had the mustache going like Dan I should did. do to his I mustache. Had the long hair, the mustache. I was Johnny Fever back in the uh, late seventies. <laughs> and you know uh, what? Bailey Quarters was actually hotter than Lonnie Anderson, I think. For sure. I believe, I'll probably get in trouble for saying that, won't I? Yeah, that's bad, Chris. That's bad. We'll, we'll edit that out. I'll edit that part out. So Dan, <laughs> give me three fundamental neural exercises that are non-negotiable. These are the three that everyone has to do, regardless of whether you're Bailey Quarters or Lonnie Anderson or Herb Tarlick or the big guy. <laughs> I'd say infinity walks you got to put in there just for the, the just the, the sophistication of the of the whole you can do it 50 million different ways and it's easy um i'd say you have to do something with your sensory motor system from your eyes i think you have to have your eyes okay involved. so that doesn't do shit for anyone give me an example i i i did remember this drill i do remember that drill that's a mainstay okay, okay? all right so we're going to calibrate our vision and then i'd say some type of vestibular drill and i talk about it in a recovery manual with cal but I'd go further into your vestibular system is in charge of your extensor muscles and your postural security. Why would we not train our vestibular system by rocking, rolling, or what we call in the IP course, dorsal glides? Oh, I wish I could. the old, like the, the, vaunt, the vaunted dorsal glide where we're, where we're rhythmically moving from top to bottom and doing anterior and posterior canal stimulation. Show us. Yes, please. Okay, so We're let's say Missouri. I, let's say I was lying down. No, do it for real. I want to see the dogs attack you. They will too. All right, hold on. This is insane. All right. Oh, good Christmas lights in the background. Oh, I just hit something. Here comes the dog. All right. <laughs> Get out of here, you mutt. She's not a mutt. I know. Okay, let me unplug this. <laughs> I knew she'd get I'm you. <laughs> That's what happens to me, too. If you're on the floor, it's fair game. You get attacked. Okay. Okay, so I'm lying down. I'm going to start to... Rock, head on the ground, chin moving up and down, and I'm rhythmically rocking, stimulating my anterior and posterior canals of my vestibular system. I am also working on a few primitive reflexes, namely the Moro um, fear response um, and the tonic labyrinth. So it's like having sex with a the ghost. There you go. So, but I'm on my back. And I'm going to rock that. Don't laugh, Tony. See, when you laugh at him, then it just gets worse. I know. Right? It's like feeding the cat. I'm going to have to cut out the last 30 minutes of this damn thing. <laughs> Sex so, with goats. So those dorsal glides are awesome for a stimulatory effect on your vestibular system. Anything else? Um, say something about, uh, uh, something that Chris has talked about. I heard it first through Chris, the stumble reflex. And then Dan, you talked about the startle reflex. Yep. I think that you have to evaluate these primitive reflexes because some of them are not integrated. And I know Dr. Heikotter has talked to both Chris and I about this stuff. I mean, you're talking about Babinski reflexes. You're talking about, um, things that can produce a huge change in the way you move just based off of how you're wired. Um, I, I do one where I tell a kid to just fall backwards and before you step back, it's gonna almost startle you. So in order to regain your balance, you are turning on everything in the front part of your body, right? Well, guess what happens to the back side of your body? It gets really loose. So it's a great stimulation 
right, of the front side, the anterior side of your body to create relaxation in your extensor chain. Wow. Right. So if I was just like standing up and I fall back and I, it's like a stumble going backwards, I am now going to co contract in the front. So you can actually use that as a training device. Absolutely. Why wouldn't I? Yeah. And then, Chris, the stumble reflex is something we talk about with starts, right? Well, just gait in general. Um, okay. That part of part of why we move it, the reflex that's built into movement is a stumble reflex, and that's the ability that you know. Extreme example is your foot gets caught, but you're going to pull it free, and then when you pull free, you actually have a stronger co-contraction on the ground. Because I mean, think about when you stumble or you catch your foot on something, how hard that next step is. Tony, it's not only because you're falling, but it's because the hard co-contraction throughout your whole body. This is where all these neural tricks like basically started from. It's, it's a basic gait pattern where certain muscles are on and certain muscles are off in the middle of a walk, right? So as you start to figure that out and that's how the body operates, you can then play a little game with that stuff in terms of what's on, what's not. That's a whole therapy in itself. And again, I'll, I'll give you an example. We worked on a guy last week who had an ankle injury and I worked on his left wrist. And if you remember in TFC when we were, I don't even know where we were, but I was increasing somebody's dorsiflexion in their ankle by moving their left wrist. And everybody's like, there's no way. Well, absolutely. It's just mapping. And then what was the thing um, at a recent TFC where if you're looking at, like a finger side of your eye, you develop more motion in your shoulder or what was that? And because, because th that convergence test, those cranial nerves, when you start, they're responsible for flexion in your body, right? So if you stimulate that, if you think about it, your eyes are going in, that's flexion. So we can stimulate certain parts of your body to get a response from a muscle. And we could spend weeks doing banded stuff to try to get that muscle to let go but you're not working in through the brain you're working into the proprioceptive system that might be shut down at that point so it's just finding a way in to get what you want give, give me something like that that you use as one of your buy-in things um i tell you what a, a hamstring one that i'll use all the time is if if I'm going down and touching my toes and I'm, I got some tightness in my hamstrings. I'm going to take my leg. I don't know if you can see this. I'm going to straighten my leg out and I'm going to move it as fast as I can. And that's going to contract what? My quad. And it's going to contract it hard and fast. Reciprocal inhibition tells us that if my quad contracts hard and fast, my hamstring is going to relax. It just has to. That's science, right? So moving that straight leg fast before a four by one might actually inoculate a sprinter from yeah, having hamstring. Inoculate? Jeez, that's yeah. a bit work. I'm not, I'm not that smart, but it's science. Vaccinate, vaccinate. Okay, vaccinate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so yeah. Prevent, prevent a freaking hamstring injury. <laughs> it could, or it could help just feel a little bit better. There you go. Any other questions on her? We're good on questions. Do you have any more else you want to add? Um, hmm. I just, like people always ask me, well, how do you, how do you start with this? What, what do you do? Well, one of the things that I evaluate all the time is balance. I think balance has gotten a bad rap in the therapy world because we're on Swiss balls or whatever we're doing. But balance is huge when it comes to gait. And if your brain isn't safe when you're on one leg, how in the hell do you expect to be productive when you're running fast? So one of my evaluations is always standing on one leg. And then we're going to evaluate with your eyes closed. We're going to evaluate with your head in different positions. And we're going to find out what your nervous system is afraid of. And then we're going to start implementing these sensory inputs to change that and um 
Chris and I are, are working on that together. We're going to talk a little bit about how we can start to change these patterns in running by using neurology and structural changes together. You know, it's interesting, Dan. Um, I'm about two thirds of the way through Bobby Straup's presentation and he's on tomorrow at noon. Mm -hmm. um, and, and basically Mahomes has been trained in the most unconventional way of any quarterback of all times. And it is so neuro, like everything is a, through a neural lens. And, mm -hmm. and you know, it's, it's, it's so cool that there could be somebody down in Tyler, Texas, working with Patrick Mahomes and somebody up in, in Rondecoit, New York, coming to very similar conclusions. Yeah. You know, and because, and they, and you come to some a long route to get there. Excuse me? It's, it's taken me a long route to get there. Like Chris said, I went through the whole strength and conditioning world to get to the neural world. When most people now, if they enter now, and they can see the neural benefits, it, it's going to save them a lot of time and a lot of injuries. And I swear, after watching Bobby's, most of his presentation, uh, Patrick Mahomes is not doesn't play the way he plays by accident. He has literally been trained to be the freaky, unique player that he is, and it's all through that neural training. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be the, fascinating. Back in the day, Mel Sif used to call it imperfection training. It was crazy. And, and there he was 25, 30 years ago talking about that. Crazy. Well, thank you, Dan. It's been fun, as always. Thanks for having me. I can't and wait to be together again. Remember tonight, drink two, and the first one doesn't count. That's exactly right. Tony, I tell you what, see, you talk about learning things at TFC. Yep. Hang on, wait, Dan. They're, they don't want you to go yet. They're holding up their lighters. Uh, what's the simplest way to talk about this stuff to sport coaches? What is the best without, way? Without, without overcomplicating. That's the story of my life. Well, I, I would say this. Everybody has primitive reflexes. Everybody has a visual system. Everybody has a vestibular system, just like we have a pair of hamstrings and we have a pair of calves. The only problem is the vestibular system is responsible for those hamstrings, is responsible for that posterior chain. Why not dig a little bit deeper into the neurology of it to figure out how those muscles actually work? And you can have huge, huge impacts on motor performance. Uh, from Brad, is your motor IP course recorded if you have to miss one of your live nights, your night's Absolutely. live? Absolutely. Yep. And Brooks would like to see one of your neural hacks that you got. Didn't we go through like three of them? I think you wants another. To, there needs to be another person. That's the thing. You can't well, I can, I, I can tell you this. So one of the first things I do with somebody is my good-sided exercises. So you got, I, I've talked about this probably at four different TFCs. Like if I have pain on my left side of my shoulder and it really hurts and I can only raise my arm up here, I'm going to mimic the movement on the other side. And I'm going to try to increase my range of motion on the good side, not the bad side. And I talk about... The, the brain pathway, the PMRF, um, and, and why it's responsible for creating that stabilization on the pain side, right? So if you have a limitation from left to right in shoulder flexion, just do this at home. Go to the good side that you have the more range of motion, and I want you to do that. Come back to the other side and test it one time, and you tell me how much better it is. I've done this for probably four different NFL teams, 20 different division one college programs. And they're all like this. Oh my God. How is that so simple? Because the brain, the PMRF is responsible for pain inhibition on that side. So if you're working on the side that hurts and it's not working for you, you better get on the other side. 
Dan, is that a possibility? I, I knew Tom Petronoff pretty well, and he was uh, a world record holder in the javelin. Mm -hmm. And he swears that he threw as many throws left-handed as he did right. Is, From an is, older is learning there, standpoint, is something too? going on there? Yeah. I mean, if he had pain in his throwing arm and he started to do the other side, absolutely. It's a way to get that neural. Before we used to call it a neural crossover, mirror therapy, all these things came about. But now when we start to look at the brain and the brainstem and what is responsible for pain, if you have pain on any part of your body, take a look at that side all the way down. That's ipsilateral to the pain. Let's say I have right knee pain. All the way down the right-hand side, you get people who have a right knee pain, right hip pain, right ankle pain. Your PMRF on that side is responsible for inhibition of that pain. So why not work on the other side? So that can, the voluntary motion controls my left hand, is controlled by my right cortex, which in turn fires the ipsilateral PMRF. So just doing this is going to help for pain on this side. That's great. It's crazy is what it is. It, it's insane to watch that work. And then in, in the, the more creative you are in terms of how you use it, like I use it in my warm-up. I call it a structural balance. I, I'm, I'm balancing things out, turning, one leg sit to stand. I go from top to bottom, balance the whole body out. Because if I start strength training and you're a guy who strength trains, and again, if that's what you do, that's what you do. And I... And my shoulder flexion is like this. When I start, I'm making a compensation. Let's balance it out. So I have right and I have left. That's even. So the, the meatheads, they understand that. Oh, oh yeah, yeah I, I should probably be balanced out. Okay, let's cut it right there. Dan, you, you're the best, man. Can't wait to be in person again. I know. I can't either, buddy. Chris, see you at noon. See you at noon tomorrow. All right. Good night, guys. Good night.